Hello, everybody. I'm so glad that you're here today to join us for the first weekly Wise Leader interview. For some of you, you've already attended the virtual book tour and caught the first seven interviews, but this is number one of the weekly edition. So every week I will come on and interview a wonderful woman in my life who is a wise leader. We'll talk about my new book, Unleash the Wise Leader in You, and how it relates to their own leadership. And you'll get to see wise leaders in action, how they got there, and what they're doing now. So today, my guest is Bikita Pegram, who we met um, through my High Achiever research, and we have connected. She is just an amazing powerhouse of a woman that I am so grateful to know. She has owned businesses. She has a master's in history. She's a doctoral candidate for educational leadership. And she has become a, she has started a nonprofit called Onyx Mentoring for high achieving African American women. Um, I hope everyone gives her a big welcome. I feel like there should be applause and welcoming her. <laughs> Hi, Bakita, how are you? Thank you. I am fine. Thank you for such a wonderful introduction. I was like, wow, who is that woman? <laughs> so thank you very much. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Is there anything you wanted to add to that? Um, I'm also a very proud wife and mother. Those things um, come very far before I do all those things that make me happy. Um, and I think they are the driving force that makes me want to do more and show my kids that you can have, have it all or get close to it. So I am I'm excited about my future, but appreciative of my past because it helped me learn and get here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, one of the things I talk about in the book is the power of your purpose mm -hmm. and really knowing your why. And I talk about in the introduction of the book how um, the loss of my father in 9-11 and the loss of my sister um, three years ago yesterday, actually, has really propelled me to um, to change the world. And, and I hear that in you. Um, can you talk some more about that, about your your inspiration for wise leadership? And I'd love to hear more about your about your journey into wise leadership, what that past looks like that brought you here. Well, I actually got into leadership very young in college, in um, undergrad. I was going to school for mass communications, business management was my minor. And I've always been one of those that you don't just study, but you put what you're studying into action. So in my undergrad, to connect with my mass communications program, I got into the TV station organization and began doing TV shows and directing and floor managing, but to tap into that business part of my program, I worked at Camelot Music in our local mall in Jackson, Mississippi, and I worked my way into becoming assistant manager. And that was so big to me being a sophomore in college and being trusted to be somebody's manager. I was like, okay. <laughs> So that um, led me into more management opportunities. I ended up getting my own record store with um, a record store out of Mississippi and moving to Alabama to run that store. I think I was 25 at the time and running that store taught me a lot about me personally, but also leadership and knowing how to build that relationship with your employees and making sure that they were happy to come to work and creating that environment that they were wanting to please the company, but also found self-fulfillment. Yeah. So I journeyed from there into the call center world when I moved to Houston, Texas. And I worked for what at the time was Houston Cellular. And then they got bought out by singular wireless and then they got bought out by AT&T. <laughs> so I got to see the change of change happen when you got bought out 
Mm-hmm. Which was good. And at that time, I was 26, 27. And being able to be in management on that level, it really was focused on customer service and building that customer base and knowing how to deal with customers when they're not so happy with the company. Mm-hmm. So doing that was, it was okay, but I was not as happy in that position because I, I wanted to do more. And um, I ended up becoming a barber. <laughs> I wanted to tap into my creative side. Wow. And being a barber was really fulfilling because I got to deal with people. And most barbers are independent contractors. So you're basically your own boss from day one. For me, I had the advantage of having prior leadership skills and business skills to help me navigate that independent contractor life and knowing how to be organized and knowing how to build a customer base and really cater to that customer base. But that had to be probably my happiest time because I was able to do some things as a leader of my own business. And the time that I put in those 60 hours and 70 hours that I was putting in in someone else's company, now I was putting in my own business. And that in itself was really um, a happy period because I was able to show my kids what being an entrepreneur was, the dedication that you had to have to it, but also balancing all of those hours with family. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that's why I said before, everything else, family comes first. And being a single mom at the time, I had my two kids. And so I did have to balance between being a business owner and now being a mom. And I think a lot of times, especially women, we are expected to be mom first, worker later, and worker being whatever that looks like. And so you see a lot of challenges, not from not only with you, but just meeting society's expectations of what you should be as a woman. Mm -hmm. And I think, I hope I balanced it well. My kids, my daughter and my son are about eight years apart. And my daughter was very adamant about family time because she was used to it. And so we had mandatory Saturdays when I got off work. Saturday was whatever family wanted to do. And that is something I think all leaders have to find that comfort zone and dedication to themselves. Make sure that you set time up for self-care. Make sure you set time up for friends and family because no matter how hard we work, you got to have time for friends and family. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I often say, you can have it all, you just can't do it all. And so, you know, you and I, I think are, are similar and we prioritize our family and our work, you know, and mm-hmm. so sometimes some things fall, <laughs> fall through the cracks, yeah. you know, not always the best at reading every single millionth email from the school, but, <laughs> but right. I'm for the kids, right? right. And there are some things, you know, you you delegate out to other okay. people, um, even getting the kids involved with chores, yeah. things like that. But um, but that's the balance, right? Knowing what your values are and putting those first. Exactly. I think that eliminates a lot of the burnout and um, anxiety that you get because I've been there. When I was a manager at AAA, I, you, you work so hard to get into these leadership positions and then you are scared to lose them. So you keep doing more and more and more. Well, to do more, something has to be left out. And I found myself leaving my family out. And that's when my daughter said, no. <laughs> we want mommy and we want mommy now. So you have to put priorities in your life. And like you said, you have to organize it in a way that you find a sweet spot of balance. And and that's what's important. And I think I had to learn that through actually doing it 
And I hope to be able to help someone after me not have to go through that part. And, and that's why I started Onyx. Yeah. Was to really help those African-American women learn early that yes, you can attempt just about everything in life, but you have to have a balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know that's a lot of the work that you and I are doing together, helping to really put the science behind what we're calling high achiever syndrome, you know, what those characteristics are, but so we can help them. So we can create assessments and, you know, buffers like mentoring and coaching to help them not end up burnt out. Right, right. Because there's no way that you're going to accomplish your purpose if you're too tired to do it. (laughs) Right, If if you're mentally drained, you can't do that. I found just taking a 15 minute nap or just a 15 minute timeout is so effective just to kind of clear your mind so that you can do those wonderful things that you are trying to do and supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And I I believe everybody has a purpose, but you have to take care of self first before you can fulfill it. It's like being on the airplane and they give you those instructions at the beginning of the flight. Before you attempt to save anyone else, you have to put the mask on yourself. And sometimes 15 minutes, you will be surprised if you put the phone down, unplug and just sit and be within space, 15 minutes can do a lot for your mental health. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think we've all had the experience, um, especially high achievers, where you're, you're like plugging through and trying to force yourself to work longer, and you're actually becoming less and less effective, less and less productive. And if you just took that 15 minute break, you could get that thing done in half the time it's yes. now, right? to force yourself yes. through. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think. So, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to ask you, what do you think are some of the distinctions or differences between wise leadership and other types of leadership? One, I think wise leadership listens. A lot of times, People think, oh, well, I'm leadership, they should listen to me. But I think the most important characteristic job task that we have is to listen first. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of times, even in changing leadership, leadership, some leadership will come in and just start changing stuff and like, okay, we need to do this, this, this. They have a plan before they even see what's going on within the organization. Sometimes you need to sit back, listen, then observe. Mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. sometimes what a person doesn't say they'll show you in action so if you observe that it'll give you way more than you sitting there and making assumptions and just asking a whole bunch of questions and reading this book and saying, okay the book says we need to do this <laughs> you know that might not fit that culture of that organization and you need to really pay attention to what's going on around you before you just come in and start trying to make a a whole bunch of changes, changes. Mm -hmm. Because you may change something that is going to change the culture and the environment to where it's not productive. So I think that is definitely one major difference between a wise leader and just a leader. Mm -hmm. I think that it starts with confidence, Mm -hmm. right? Like when you're confident in your own leadership, then you're not trying to to prove yourself to everybody. You know that you're a wise leader and you're owning that, you're claiming it. Um, And so you're open to listening, you're open to other people's ideas, you're open to not having to rush in and change everything. You're willing to take in the landscape to see where you fit in rather than dominating. Yes, I totally agree. it does take confidence in your abilities to go in and do those things. Sometimes when you're trying to push the fact that you're a leader by do this, 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 it's counterintuitive what you're really supposed to be doing. Right, right. You're supposed to be building your team. It's really not about you. It's about developing others. Right. And I think that's the important thing. 
is really about. Yeah, exactly. And that's one thing that we train our mentors on with Onyx is the first component of being a mentor is listening. Because you don't always have to fix it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the fixing comes in just listening, letting someone be heard. And I think that's the part of leadership people may miss sometimes is most employees just want to be heard and valued, knowing that what they have to say mean something because even though yes you may be the leader they're actually on the front lines dealing with the daily business of the business right right and i think with mentoring or coaching you know what you're really doing is facilitating their own problem solving helping them find the answers that they probably have already, right? So it's through that listening and empathizing and asking them powerful questions. It's not really about spoon feeding them the answer. It's getting them to have that critical thinking to discover it themselves. Dead on. And that's, that again is something that we're teaching mentors is this is not you fixing a person. This is you empowering a person to use their own critical thinking skills to better their situation or just giving them that confirmation that, oh, okay, I did think that through correctly. I did make the best decision for me and celebrating those wins that we sometimes take for granted. You know, making an A on a, a test in Dr. Hard professor class is <laughs> someone that you need to celebrate. <laughs> so, right. you know, sometimes as a high achiever, we do things and we don't slow down enough to celebrate it ourselves. Mm -hmm. So having that social support network around us that can help us say, hey, you know what, what you did was great. Mm -hmm. Stop, slow down, celebrate that win. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in two different chapters of the book, I really talk about um, one is about lifting each other up and the other is about assembling your tribe and really consciously choosing who's going to be in that tribe. And I think it's, you know, it is those people who are going to rally with you, who are going to cheerlead, who, who get what you're doing and support you. And that can include mentorship, coaching, friends, family, but it's being really mindful about who you let into that circle yes. so that there isn't negativity in there. Yes, I totally agree. I think networking is a beautiful way to find that social support because um, my husband, for instance, I tell everybody he's my biggest cheerleader, but I know that he has no interest in educational leadership whatsoever. <laughs> So I had to find people that did have that interest so that when I call them and say, guess what? I found this great review about higher achiever syndrome and it talks about the characteristics. They can really buy into that. My husband is just like, yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not really getting that outlet or that conversation that I need to bounce ideas off. Sometimes you have to find and I tell my mentors now, uh, in my mentees, you have to find more than one mentor. You yeah. need one more than one mentor in different areas of your research, different areas of your work, different areas of your life, because that can give you a different perspective than just having this one person that you're draining about everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think what you're also saying is that that inner circle, that tribe of yours, like different people are going to fulfill different needs and different roles, right? Your exactly. husband is like, yes, you've got this. I believe in you. Skip the details, please. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right. Yes. And then, you know, your geeky friends like me are like, <laughs> tell me the yes. details. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know I can call Donna and say, Donna, I saw this great interview this weekend and they were talking about higher achiever syndrome and you're going to be so excited and we're going to talk about it for about an hour or two and have to tell each other to stop. I get that detailed with a friend or my husband and it's like, <laughs> crickets. <laughs> right, crickets, yeah. So yes, I think it's important to find that um, tribe, that social support 
to help you in different areas. And I think high achievers really need to know it's okay. Yeah. You don't have to know everything. Mm -hmm. You're not expected to be perfect at everything. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to have someone to confirm your thoughts. It's okay to have someone to just listen. And I think a lot of times society thinks high achievers don't need help. <laughs> right. And even high achievers think that, right? I'm yes. so good. I can handle this, you know, kind of telling ourselves the story, you know, if you want something done right, you have to do it yourself, all mm -hmm. of this. Exactly. Yeah. And I found that to be the hard way. It's okay to ask for guidance because one, you may find it a faster way, a more efficient way to do it so that you don't have to be all in for 24 hours to get something done. And right. I think high achievers, like you said, may not even realize that they need this help because they are sitting up burning the midnight oil, trying to get it done that they just push through and people around them say, well, she did it. Yeah, yeah. but what if she would have done it a different way that she right. could have gotten some help? And um, I think that's why our research is so important to identify those characteristics, but also to identify ways to reduce the impact of high achievers. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I'm dying to hear the story and I think our audience is too. How do you go from barber <laughs> to doctoral candidate in educational leadership. And that's funny because I get the question a lot because it's not just a, um, a, a, a straight line, definitely by far. I became a barber because I do have an interest in hair. I've always had an interest in hair, but to be honest, you know, I grew up, that was not a... a financial fulfilling job. Mm -hmm. It may have been a personal fulfilling job because I do think I'm very creative and it tapped into that part of me. But the driving force again was my kids. I wanted to be a hands-on mom, but I also wanted to provide a, a decent living for them as well. Mm -hmm. And I got tired of working 67 hours, 60 to 70 hours a week in corporate America. And I said, you know what? While my kids are growing up, I want to be present. So what will allow me to do that? And that was me becoming my own boss. And barbering being something that I did find that I had natural talent in, I, I said, okay, let's go all in. AAA was getting ready to um, lay off. And they offered me the head trainer position in Dallas where they were going. But I didn't want to move to Dallas. And I said, okay, this is the time. This is the time to jump out on faith and see what can happen. And faith brought me from being a barber, reading, renting a booth in someone else's shop to owning my own salon or barbershop and becoming, as I used to tell people, your loctician's favorite loctician. <laughs> So I became a specialist in doing locks and cutting hair, and it fed me from 2003 to 2017. Wow. And um, did hair shows at the Black Expo as one of the um, leading um, barbershops in the area, featured in barber magazines. It was fun. It was fun, but it was a means for me to be the type of mother that I wanted to be. So once my kids got to that age where they were about to leave the nest, I went back to school and I got my teacher certification and I started teaching in 2016, um, taught Texas history, loved it to death, learned a lot about Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, in all, in the high achiever fashion, I want more. <laughs> That's nice. uh, Yes. So, so I went and got my master's degree from Jackson State, where I got my undergrad. And I, um, I said, I'm going to use my master's to become an adjunct. And then I'll work on my doctorate, maybe. Just depends on how this master's goes. <laughs> and um, finished my master's in two years, with, defended my thesis. And I was like, okay, I think I still have something in me. 
I can finish this doctorate if I just plow through. <laughs> and um, scared to death, I'll never forget my first night of class for my doctorate program. Dr. Parker sat us down and he said, you're the elite of the elite, we picked you for a reason and we wanna see you do great things and this is your home now, go forth. <laughs> and I was like, okay. But one thing I can definitely say about Prairie View is they have really equipped us with the confidence in the opportunities that we need to be successful. And it is a program that you don't just go and take class. It's a program that they encourage you to reach out to re other researchers. <laughs> they encourage you to do conferences and it's all to build you up to be the best researcher you can be. And I feel like, I know I'm not done, but I do feel like they have prepared me for the moments like this and going forward. So my transition from barbering to doctoral candidate has been very fluid. It doesn't seem like the dots connect, <laughs> but in a way that they do, because barbering allowed me to do what I needed to do as a mother, but still fulfill some of my professional and um, personal aspirations and ambitions. And now I'm able to teach because I taught Bible school for years, um, led Bible school, led Bible um, study programs. I am now able to turn that passion of teaching and sharing knowledge into a profession. And I'm like, what else would you rather be doing than sharing knowledge? So why not make a career of it? And that's how that's transition from barbering to teaching to now being a doc student happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a great story and so many points in there. I just, I just want to um, point out to the audience about, you know, one, I think it's amazing for our kids, boys and girls to see a role model to see, you know, that moms can be mom, they can be CEO, they can be successful they don't have to put their life and their dreams, you know, in a bucket to wait until their kids are all grown, right? right. Um, you know, and I think too, like high achievers are everywhere, right? And it doesn't, you don't have to be the CEO to be a high achiever. You were a high achieving barber, right? You have this, I mean, the things you did, the expos and the magazines and you know, it's, it's amazing. And it's not the type of career you choose that makes you a high achiever. It's certain characteristics and personality traits and work ethic that do that. And I'm glad you pointed that out because I know that's something you and I talked about in our research. We want people to know that a high achiever is not just the CEO. It's not just Bill Gates. It's not just Brezos. It's that um, local bakery that will draw people in by the hundreds to get that one cupcake because they know it's amazing. It's that professor that can juggle being a researcher, a, a professor, a mentor, and do all these things at a, a great level. It's that teacher in the classroom that creates these great Bitmoji classrooms and totally engages their, their class, but builds a rapport with them through handshakes or um, dances and songs. So you're right, there's different occupations that you'll find high achievers in. And it's not just the those elite positions that you think about in corporate America. Exactly, exactly. I wanna be conscious of your time because I know you have class, but before you go, I just wanna hear a little bit more about Onyx mentoring, how that how that happened and fits in with this and how people can support you in that amazing program. Thank you. Um, Onyx came about out of research. I had began doing research on stereotype threat and Dr. Steele's book brought me into looking at high achievers. And when I was looking at high achievers and some of the things that they go through and the symptoms that they display when trying to accomplish some of their dreams, I was like, okay, so how can we 
reduce that? How can we help them through these symptoms? And I started looking at mentoring and mentoring provides a social support to people to help them with um, encouragement, um, helps them with guidance, help them be able to express themselves when they may not be able to express themselves to family or friends. It gives them training, but it also helps them empower them with their own voice. So I was like, okay, so why can't I merge the two? And I um, was doing this research in one of my classes, it was educational technology. And I looked at ways technology and mentoring could be used with high achiever and stereotype threat. And then when I looked at it, I said, well, what if I just focused on African-American women? Because as I was doing my research, we are the most understudied population, not just even high achievers. A lot of times people look at African-Americans and it's always on the deficit end, the lack of something. Mm -hmm. So that leaves high achievers just kind of floating around where all the focus is on the social economic um, status of African-Americans. Um, what they don't have as far as education, what they don't have as far as technology. And there's a lot of research on that, but again, high achievers were kind of just out there. They were acknowledged as a group. They were acknowledged as being a part of the educational pro system and process, but they didn't have any solutions for this group of people. And I said, well, I wanna help. So what if I focus on undergrad African-American females and provide them mentors that would help them with perseverance, innovation, faith, community service, and social justice. Those are our five principles and onyx. And each one of those principles we take monthly and we work on. So our first month was perseverance and we focused on goal setting and voting. So it's, voting could be a, a little bit more social justice as well, but we put it under perseverance because at this day and age, you really have to persevere <laughs> to be able to get your, vo your voice heard. And that is through voting. And um, so each month we'll take a principal and we walk our mentees and our mentors through a training to give them that power. Mm -hmm. So at the end of each semester, they have gone through four trainings and then that next semester, they actually put those trainings into action. So as far as goal setting, we'll look at what goals they set in September and we'll go back and see if they accomplished it, what happened? And if they didn't, what happened? And we'll make revisions because I think high achievers think when they fail at a task, it's over. It's way more detrimental to a high achiever to fail then I think the rest of the society, because if we make a B, it's like, whoa, what did I do? The end of the world. Yeah. Yes. Whereas, as my um, son would say, C's get degrees. <laughs> I'm like, no, <laughs> that is not true. <laughs> but a high achiever has this inside ambition and it's not it's nothing that the world created is nothing that the world said you've got to do this it's from internal it's it's something that we aspire to accomplish everything at a high level yeah but sometimes they need to know it's okay and yeah. and that's what the perseverance part is about that we're working on with our mentees now is letting them know it's okay it's not the end of the world let's revise this and see if there's another road to it. Right, right. And that's one of the things I loved about your story too, is you're, you know, being candid, like, oh, so my daughter said, you're, you're not around, this isn't going to fly, right? And it's like, we are going to make mistakes, there are going to be times we're out of balance, yeah. um, course correct, and it's not the end of the world. And right. um, those are, those are opportunities for growth. And I do think, mentoring is needed to help high achievers with that because it's not their natural way of being right because yeah. 
high achievers think you have to be perfect and there is no perfect yeah but we have to teach them it's okay to have to revise a plan it's okay to have to leave a plan it's just making them aware that it's not the end of the world and to give themselves a little slack every now and then absolutely absolutely how can people find onyx or contact you if they have an interest in the program right now you can go to twitter um, onyx mentoring and when you go to onyx mentoring on twitter you'll see our google sites link um, you'll also be able to contact me through onyx mentoring at gmail.com or bikita pegram at gmail.com great i'm also going to put this information in the comments section I will go through the comments and answer any questions or tag Bakita if the questions are for her to answer and also the links. Um, I wanted to just hit home, please go out and vote. There's a chapter in Unleash the Wise Leader about finding your voice. Voting is an extension of finding your voice. Yes. Um, my husband and I went out and did early voting on Monday go vote, go early if you can. And um, this is a crucial time in our country and your voice needs to be heard. Exactly. We're actually taking our mentees out on October 13th and we'll be voting. And again, that was one of the things that we um, worked on for the month of September is making sure that they were registered to vote. We have some mentees that are from um, California, Tennessee, Seattle, and we just encourage them to check back with their home states. Um, the one student that was with Cali, we were actually able to get her registered online and they sent her an absentee ballot. So Great. that's why I said that perseverance, because even if you don't know and it's not right in front of you, you have to figure it out. And figuring out how to vote is something that we all need to persevere through and make it happen. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to ask for help. Yes. You know, that is a place where really, you know, it's your, it's your right and you want to exercise it for sure. For sure. So if you're interested in the book, Unleash the Wise Leader in You, or the accompanying workbook, they are both available on Amazon. Uh, you can get all the Wise Leader products, the album, the card deck, the books at drdonnamarino.com. And all of this information will be in the comments. Thank you so much, Bakita, for joining us, for sharing your wisdom with us and, and enlightening us all. Um, it's been a joy to talk with you as always. Thank you, Donna. I appreciate it. And congratulations on your book. It's wonderful. And yes, please buy it. She even has the Kindle version if you don't want to carry the book and you can have it with you on your phone and tablet. It's wonderful. Thank you so much, Bakita. You have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye.